simple, but sort of give the key concepts. So that is, uh, yeah, anyway, so. But yeah, excited. that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly what I was, I was thinking that I wanted to put together formally around cell migration. Um, all right, I think. Okay, sorry, I just had to mute myself. All right, I think we are up on the YouTube live stream. I'm still being clawed at a little bit, so I'll try not to grimace. Um, it's right at the hour, so I'm sure people will um, keep coming in as we start the introduction, but I'm going to go ahead and get started to give you maximum time. Um, so welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have this is just two more um, seminars for the spring 2020 season. So today we are delighted to have Dr. Karian Neeson. Karian heads the Department of Cell Biology of the Skin and is the Scientific Director of the Excellence Cluster focusing on aging and aging associated diseases at the University of Cologne. She did her PhD with Arnold Sonberg at the Netherlands Center Institute, uh, sorry, the Netherlands Cancer Institute, excuse me. Um, and she did her postdoc with G Barry Gumbier at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. So Dr. Neeson's research interests focus on how regulation of cell shape controls tissue function, and we will be hearing about that today. Um, so with that, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so I'll hand you the floor, Karian, and thank you again for your unwavering support of the series. Um, you've been here since the beginning, and it's always been great to have you here, and thank you for being here and being able to talk today. So with that, um, please go ahead. Well, thanks very much, Jen, and also um, Adam and, and, and other organizers, because I'm really excited about this series, I have to say. So since uh, I haven't, I used to work on integrins, thought a lot more about cell migration, but realized that the problems that we have, although not classical cell migration, actually involve a lot of the same mechanisms, and we're really trying to understand those. So basically what my lab is interested in is really how do you make, maintain and restore epithelial barriers? And we are very interested in, in, in cell polarity as well as cell cell adhesion, but we also realize that in many of the epithelial cell uh, epithelial tissues uh, to form these barriers, they use these different modules in a different way to actually then build very different barriers, basically. And our specific, my specific love has been for a long time, the skin epidermis actually coming from the integrin field, actually Barry discovered that this result in skin blistering diseases. And uh, I've been intrigued, how do you actually build, we know a lot also from lower organisms on how building simple epithelial barriers, but we actually still don't understand very well how this works in making a multi-layered uh, epidermal barrier. And one of the questions that we're of course asking since we're thinking about polarity and, and, and intercellular adhesion, so how that are key factors for cell shape. So how does regulation of cell shape then controls tissue function? Now, what I think is very intriguing, if you look at these very various epithelial barriers, there's, of course, many of them are actually fastly self-renewing barriers. That means that they have to maintain barrier function in the face of renewal and in the face of cellular movement, basically. And if you look at the intestine, we know that the stem cell compartment, the proliferative compartment, is physically separated from the migratory and barrier forming compartment, which is more in the phyllis department. And the same is true if you look at this multi-layered uh, epidermis, basically, where we have the basal cells, where we know the stem cells are, and where proliferation takes place, and we both have symmetric and asymmetric divisions that are thought to contribute also directly to making, you know, positioning a cell in the suprabasal layer. And so, and where you also have the tight junctions, which in simple epithelial cells are all within the same as where the adherence junctions and the, desmos and the desmosomes as well as uh, focal contacts and hemidesmosomes are. But here we know that the functional tight junctions are actually only positioned at the stratum granulosum, so at the last layer before you have terminal differentiation and ultimately form this dead cornified cell layer, basically. So the questions that we're basically asking, so the, again, there's the spatial separation of, of function, of fate and function within these tissues, basically. So the questions that we're trying to answer, focusing on cell-cell adhesion and signaling, basically, how do epithelia preserve fate functional compartments while renewing? And how do individual cells move and change fate between different compartments? And then finally, how do you then, how do disturbances in cell shape regulation and fate compartments promote disease basically? So those are the questions that we're sort of trying to address. And I don't think we have all of the answers. So my title is somewhat presumptuous because I don't think we can literally say that cell shape regulates it, but I think we have some strong evidence indicating that. <laughs> 
So just to introduce the epidermis here a little bit, this is basically a self-renewing tissue. We have these basal cells. They undergo either you know, uh, the divisions in the plane of the basal cell layer, renewing the basal cell compartment. And then we have cells that can delaminate and move up. And then they line up in this, what we call the barrier compartment where there, and this layer is basically uh, the, the tight junctions. And then ultimately they undergo this terminal differentiation program and making the stratified epidermis basically. As you saw on the end, there's also an asymmetric division there that also does that. So what that means on the tissue scale is that you have to maintain these fate compartments, but at the single cell scale, these cells have to move and cross into these different compartments to guarantee proper renewal and to guarantee both tissue resilience as well as barrier function while undergoing renewing. So that means that we have to have very dynamic cell cells, intercellular rearrangements, as well as cell, cell matrix rearrangements. But at the same time, we have to preserve tissue integrity to guarantee a barrier function. And so this is still a big question, how is that actually working? And for those of you who care, so this barrier is actually the, one of your biggest barriers of the, of the body, and it protects both against water loss, so it allows us to live on land, but it also protects against microbes and infection. It has a strong innate immune function, UV and radiation, heat, cold, as well as chemicals, basically. So, and if you look a little bit more, and based on what we know a little bit, there is some suggestion on the physics of this movement. So, and we've sort of tried to give, give you some comparisons here. So what you're seeing that in the basal to suprabasal transition, that single cells move out, sort of stepping out of line, and this line then needs to close, basically. And um, I will talk a little bit about jamming and unjamming in this area that we did work that we did together with Sarah Wickstrom. Now, what is based on, on actually live cell imaging, especially spearheaded by the lab of Valentina Grego, but also by the lab of... Um, um, of uh, Masa Amagai in Japan, is what they show that in the spinous layers, these cells seem to move relatively freely. So there is not a clear path of where they're going. So this, so this is sort of more looking like when you're in a big mass and you want to find your quickest way, you basically move in between these people where you see a little hole and then you go basically. So this seems to be more fluid-like instead of not so fixed basically in movement, physically speaking. And then in the granular layer, what you really have is you line up and it becomes more of an escalator type of movement because now these cells don't exchange neighbors anymore. They basically are sort of in an escalator type and they simply move off with respect to their neighboring sort of units. Um, and so, but there is no active cell rearrangements anymore. And we still don't really know what the physical properties are, as well as the driving physical mechanisms that actually cause these cells to move, basically. But we do know that, that there is a very specific mechanism how to keep the barrier function. That is beautiful work from Masa Amaga. So what I find really intriguing when we started to then look and think about cell shape, so it was obvious that there's a big change of cell shape when you move from basal layers to suprabasal layers. And to get a bit better of an idea what exactly these cell shapes are is that we crossed mice with the rainbow and then we characterized so that we could really you know, label individual cells within the epidermis and then measured more volume as well as sphericity and all of that. And these are just three mice, but we measure more cells. So this is the average of one mouse is basically given here. And the higher you are here is basically uh, the closer you are to the end. So here you can see those different cell shapes sort of uh, initiated. And what you can see is that there's actually very stereotypic changes in cell shape when you go through these different layers, suggesting that this regulation of cell shape in which the epidermis puts a lot of you know, effort is actually really important. So, and what we also see is that in diseases, you start to uncouple cell fate, shape, and position within the tissue. And this is, for example, psoriatic skin. And here you have K10, which is a marker for, di for, the, for the suprabasal differentiated layers. And K14 is a marker for the basal um, proliferating layers. And I hope you can appreciate that actually these markers are now sort of become intermixed. And you see that this proliferative marker, this keratin 14, is now really highly expressed suprabasal layers, that these cells have a lot of cell shape change and the same is true when you look, for example, at invasion, but also um, um, uh, in, 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 in other inflammatory barrier um, diseases that are coupled to a, 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 a disturbed barrier function. So what we're seeing in diseases that we have disturbed fate and functional compartments, but we don't know if these if this disturbance is actually a cause or a consequence of these uh, of these diseases. <clears throat> 
Now, and that brings me, of course, that, that it suggests that actually that there are strong boundaries between these compartments that actually allow you to keep these fate compartments present while you're actually renewing. And, and the advantage, of course, as many of you know, for, for these boundaries is that if you, for example, have excessive cell proliferation without any boundary mechanism, these fate compartments would immediately mix. Whereas if you have a strong boundary mechanism, then you actually can still preserve fate compartments while you're having increased proliferation, basically. But the same is true for tissue deformation. And I now realize I forgot one slide because, of course, the skin is continuously all day through. We're sitting, we're moving, we have compression, we have stretching, all of these kind of things. So the skin really has to deal with a lot of forces that are on a daily basis exerted to it. And if you then have tissue deformation, again, if you have no boundary formation, it would be very very easy to mix these compartments, but with a boundary mechanism, we're actually still able to um, maintain those uh, compartments. And so the question that we then had, and we know this, of course, boundary formation and the setup for, of, of the, the making of, of boundaries is really well established in development, but actually for renewing tissues, I think this concept is not very well established yet. And we know that in development, this is important. Uh, for example, in the Drosophila larval wing disc, where you have anterior posterior fate boundaries as dorsal ventral, but also if you look in the mammalian neuroepithelium, we know that both signaling and mechanics can actually regulate these uh, rhomboid lineage restricted boundaries basically to actually pattern the brain. And so the question that we're really asking, and I don't think I can give you a definite answer, as, but, but what we hypothesize is that they're really basal to apical mechanical boundaries, both for fate and function within this tissue that allow you to really have the proliferative compartments separated from the different differentiated compartments uh, through mechanical regulation. And the reason why we actually think that is if you look at the epidermis, and now here again, you have this basal proliferated later, and we know that if you look at just simply the cadherin codes, and I now only look at classical cadherins as well as desmosomal cadherins, but we're right now actually doing um, proteomics of each of the layers to also look, for example, for efferents and, 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 and also repulsive signals, that you can see that, for example, if you now take the classical cadherins, there are mainly two of them, P cadherin is very specifically expressed only in the basal layer, whereas E cadherin is actually expressed in all layers. I will talk a little bit about vincolin because we know that vincolin is highly enriched only in this granular layer where the tight junctions are. And I'll come back to that. And the same is true for keratin. So keratins have a very specific switch where they go from keratin 5 and 14 in the basal layer. We also use those as differentiation markers to a switch to keratin 1 and 10, basically. And then for the desmosomal cadherins, you see that there's a switch from more desmoglein 3 to actually desmoglein 1 in suprabasal layers, uh, and as well as other where you see in the higher layers, you also get desmocolin 1 and desmoglein 4 more expressed only in the granular compartment, again, which is one of the barrier comp forming compartments. And what uh, the, the lab of Fiona Watt has shown is that actually look at stiffness, if you just do uh, using atomic force on tissue sections, what they showed is that there's actually a stiff, the stiffness gradient that is accompanying these very stereotypic cell shape changes that is basically going from less stiff to from the basal layer to increasing stiffness in the suprabasal layers. And again, so what we then propose is that at the tissue level, we have basically molecular mechanisms that probably coordinate mechanical boundaries that maintain the fake boundary. But of course, again, we have to then understand how the single cell level is actually breaking this boundary to move in and how it that couples to cell fate changes. So those questions we're sort of trying to ask. And just to show you that actually we think this code is important, and this is work from Kathy Green, so I cannot take any honor for it. But what she basically showed is that if you have desmoglein 1, which is actually this cadherin that is expressed very early in development, it starts to be expressed and then is localized to the apical membrane domain of the, of the basal layer, that this increased expression is important because if you now put this in simple epithelial MDCK, simply the expression of desmoglein 1 actually results in multi-layering. So basically making a second epidermal, uh, basically a second uh, epithelial sheet. And that suggests that these, these, these codes that we're seeing are actually really important to making a, a multi-layered uh, epithelial barrier. So um, let me just uh, now then, so how do we then create compartments? And, and my first little bit that I want to talk about, and we've published this a couple of years ago, is how do you position the tight junctional barrier only in the stratum granulosum layer two? 
And, and what is the role then of the adhesive code in regulating that? And of course, in simple epithelia, we know that the tight junctions are apically positions, but it happens all within the same cell as where the adherence junctions are and the desmosomes are. But those are actually all in all of the layers, basically, but with different composition. So we're basically asking then, how do you position, and this is now a staining for CO1, and we use whole mount uh, tissue imaging. So this is really the tissue, not the not cell culture. And then you see this, this is only the SG2 layer, and I hope you can appreciate this beautiful digunctional network that is formed in the skin, basically, uh, to preserve a barrier function. And so what we actually found, and this, so I want to cut this a little bit short, is that if we used alpha-18, which is this antibody that basically uh, can only detect the unfolded alpha-catenin that allows finculin binding to strengthen the junctions. And I hope, again, this is in the tissue, so we did whole mounts, and I hope you can see that there's this very nice enrichment of alpha-18, and the same goes for finculin, only in the stratum granulosum layer two, and this is the layer where the tight junctions are formed. This coincides with really a very tissue polarization of F-actin with the highest F-actin organization in the SG2 and especially in the SG1 cells. And if you then look and just zoom in, in these SG2 cells and now just ask how is then this apical tight junctional layer, how is that positions towards the, 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 the cadherin a finkel in positive uh, junctions, then you can see that in, in, in pink is basically CO1, that's most apically, and this is supported, even if these cells are very flat, by a basal lateral cadherin finkel in positive um, uh, junctions, basically. So what we then have in the epidermis is that we have mechanical polarization of junctions, not only across layers, with the tension high adherence junctions as marked by finkel in and unfolded alpha-catenin, only in the layer that forms the tight junctions, whereas the lower layers have what we call sort of adherence junction tension low layers. But then even within this very flat layer, we see really classical cell polarity with really the tight junctions really being apically in the cell and that are supported by that network. And so then we ask this actually e cadherin and remember e cadherin is expressed in all of these layers. So how does e cadherin do, do how, how does e cadherin regulate this? And so we basically asked, can we, um, so is, is loss of e cadherin does it actually affect the mechanics? Because we know that they still form very nice desmosomes. And we know that desmosomes are very important for epithelial mechanical resistance. So when we did this on, on doublets of cells, just to look at traction force microscopy and then calculate basically um, the, the intercellular tension, we see that loss of e cadherin, even if these cell doublets make desmosomes, actually does affect the intercellular tension state, basically. And then we used again just cell culture where we can actually stratify in, in, in normal cell, on tissue culture plastic, I should say. We stratify these layers so you get a multi layered epidermis that don't, doesn't form the stratum corneum because there's no terminal differentiation, but it still forms the tight junctions. And if you then ask but, uh, what is then the, the cortical stiffness of the most apical layer, then you can see that loss of e cadherin again results in a, in a reduced uh, cortical stiffness of these layers, basically. And so then, is this important? Is this at all important for the tight junctions? And yes, it is, because if we now do this whole mount tissue uh, um, imaging again, again, you can appreciate here, this is for CO1, but you can take any tight junctional marker, this beautiful network that is formed. And this network is still formed, but I hope you can appreciate that this network now has many, many breaks. And this really explains why these mice actually die at birth, because they lose a lot of water. So we've published that years ago, but we never understood really why that was. And I think this image explains, at least for me, immediately made obvious why that's happened. But what is perhaps more interesting is, whereas these tight junctions are really highly enriched in this SG2, these are these dots that represent the tight junctions, we now see premature tight junction formation that are non-functional in the lower layers. And perhaps more interesting, and for me at least, as coming from as a classical cadherin biology, I always think that cadherins promotes cortical effect in organization. What we're now starting to see that upon loss of e cadherin, we actually see increased cortical effect in organization in lower layers, really suggesting that e cadherin somehow regulates. Um, the cortical actin organization to really only position tight junctions where you want to have them in that SG2 layer. And what I haven't shown you, but this is actually accompanied by increased internalization of occludin. 
So one, so basically, just to summarize this, so what we actually think that is happening is that these low attention adherence junction tension low states actually actively inhibit tight junctions as well as cortical effect and organization, and then through some unknown switch, we basically increase the tension in the adherence junctions, and this promotes tight junctions, and then allows the stabilization and positioning of these tight junctions apically in these layers. So we then asked, because we know that, of course, ECAT hearing can control both mechanics as well as some signaling processes, what is then important? And all I can tell you, we're still thinking a lot about the mechanics, but what we initially did is we initially thought that Finkelin was key for this, but loss of Finkelin does result in a slight defect of tight junction function, but these mice are still viable. But the positioning in this SG2 is actually not affected. We still see polarization of affectin. We still see positioning, proper positioning of these tight junctions. And the same is true when we actually inactivated myosin 2. So we then went on and thought of maybe a little bit more about signaling. And what was known already that if we lo lose e adherent, that we actually get an increase in EGF receptor signaling. And this is seen over here. This is again in vivo. So this is just phospho EGF receptor signaling. And then we actually asked, because EGF receptor signaling is very important for basal proliferation. So there's many studies on the role of EGF receptor in, 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 in proliferation. But to our surprise, when we looked where the EGF receptor actually was, we found that there is a substantial uh, increase and, and, and uh, enrichment at sites of tight junctions for the EGF receptor. And then we actually asked, is this activation basically, so if we get less, so because we lose ECAT here and we have less stiffness, we have less cortical activity. So is when we just simply reduce cortical tension or actomyosin contractility, can we actually increase EGF receptor activity? And that's what we did here. So yes, we can, but more importantly, and now we do this in cell culture, so we can actually follow the buildup of the barrier when we switch from low calcium to high calcium, and that's seen over here. And then we basically in induce cell-cell junction formation and ultimately barrier formation, and we measure trans-epithelial resistance. And as you can see, nicely you build this up, and if you now have ECAT here in, uh, alone, then you basically see that you have this impaired barrier function, basically. And if you now have low levels of EGF receptor inhibition, we actually rescue this barrier formation. If we completely inhibit the EGF receptor, we actually completely prevent junction formation. And the timing of adding this, this EGF receptor inhibitor is actually very important, because if we do it too early or too late, we actually don't see this effect, basically. But more importantly, we then asked, is the signaling also important for the cortical state? And what we actually now did is taking again the e e e e knockouts, taking uh, inhibiting EGF receptor, and then measuring the cortical stiffness of a multi-layered uh, keratinocyte sheet. And again, we could show that we can in part rescue cortical stiffness upon loss of e adherent by inhibiting EGF receptor activity. So what we actually believe, and, and, and later on, actually, Kathy, who actually did a sabbatical in my lab, basically, together with Josh Broussard, also showed that DSG1 actually regulates ERB2 signaling and that there are counter gradients and that a similar mechanism also comes from signaling from the desmosomes. And that we think that this, this, this junctional low state really actively inhibits tight junctions in part by controlling tyrosine kinase receptor signaling in, in, in the right way. And that we still, I have to say, we still don't know what the switch is, how they go to an adherent junction tension high, but this then, at least for the EGF receptor, results in very efficient inhibition, allowing these tight junctions to stabilize and basically form and properly position within the tissue to allow the barrier to be there spatially where you want the barrier to be positioned, basically. Okay, so that is sort of, so this is how you can actually make a functional compartment by simply creating these mechanical differences within the tissue. So we then wanted to address a little bit more, and this is work we did together with Sarah Wickstrom. So how do you then overcome these barriers? How do you move into a new fate compartment, basically? And uh, which signals determine whether a cell remains basal or differentiate to move up? And one of the things that Sarah noticed when she was making these, uh, I hope the movie plays, let me see, yeah, there it is, sorry, that she actually found that if we take, and this is now human primary keratinocytes, at a certain point when they come really super confluent, they actually go from a fluid-like state to a more solid-like state. And when that happened, what she actually found is that delamination, but only when they were in this solid-like state, delamination was actually very closely associated with cell division. 
And the same was true when we looked actually with live act E15.5 embryos. Again, looking at that basal cell, we saw that delamination, the chance to delaminate was much more closer to mitosis than, uh, in, in, uh, than when you looked at random mitosis, basically. So that suggested that maybe compression, when the cell divides, that maybe compression would be one way of how you can actually delaminate and then start to differentiate. And to really sort of look at this, we actually asked if crowding is sufficient to induce differentiation. So what we actually basically took is a, a confluent layer that we put on the stretch and we kept it on the stretch and then we let go and see if this compression was sufficient to simply induce differentiation. And these are markers, loricrine, all are actually basically are, are differentiated markers. And as you can see here, when we now crowd after, especially after six hours, or when we really have crowded confluent layers, you can actually start to see this induction of differentiation, where as you do this in 50% confluent sheets, so simply the, the, the stretch release is not sufficient to do this. So it's really the crowding that seems to be doing that. And data I'm not going to show you is that we actually found that the cell that differentiates initially lowers cortical tension and then later on increases cortical tension. And this was associated with cell shape and isotropy, uh, basically. So, and if you now look, this is again in vivo, we can actually see these cells. This is one of those cells that is both K14 and K10. So it, it expresses still basal proliferating markers as well as the differentiated markers. And I hope you can appreciate how beautifully cell shape change this cell already is. Of course, this is a snapshot in time. And so we were asking what is actually really then important for the adhesion mechanics and delamination? Is it really initially, is compression somehow you know, limiting access to the cell matrix and does that induce delamination and the cortical changes necessary? Or is it actually first the changes in cell cell adhesion that actually precede then changes in cell matrix adhesion. And so we started to look at that. And the reason for that was also that, that um, um, Fiona Watt has years and years ago already shown very beautifully in vitro that the, that the cells that differentiate actually are also the cells that move up. So again, also in vitro, you can actually phenocopy this positioning and fate changes basically. So, and what I can tell you is that when we looked, sorry, when we looked at the, the cell matrix, at least at focal adhesions and beta one integrins, and when we knocked those down, we didn't see the changes in cortical actin that we saw uh, when we actually knocked down E cadherin. So we focused more on E cadherin. And what we initially saw is that when you have, so this is one hour of differentiation where we have still very little differentiation markers but that increased differentiation results in increased cell-cell adhesion. And then we did also using atomic force microscopy where we actually looked at the interaction between and the force necessary to actually get these cells um, basically detached. And then we also looked again at cortical tension using AFM. And what was very interesting that in undifferentiated cells, E cadherin loss, but not P cadherin loss, was actually increasing tension. And that fit with that we initially saw that when cells were about to differentiate and started to sort, they had initially a decrease in cortical tension. But if you now look at long-term differentiation, now E cadherin is actually important for increasing cortical tension. Because now, if you now knock down E cadherin, you see a decrease in cortical tension, basically. And again, the effect of P cadherin was much less. And what was it, what, what we then also found, if we then looked at whether E cadherin in and of itself in the mono layer is sufficient to get changes in cell shape, we actually found that the cell shape index, that is basically the difference between, um, sorry, the, the cell shape index, which is basically Lisa Manning, um, who has a theoretical model to calculate those and that the cell shape index is actually increased in E cadherin. And so then we ask, is this cell shape in and of itself sufficient to maybe get local cell sorting and to position cells to move up? And here we worked basically with uh, Lisa Manning and what she, what she actually found, I'm sorry, what she, let me go back one. Um, so what she actually found that if you use heterotypic line tension and you have two populations and you only introduce a, a different heterotypic line tension, then these po populations will have a very sharp boundary and completely sort out from each other. However, if you take the cell shape difference, so this delta basically from the shape index, and then the, if you have two populations with two different with basically the delta shell, cell shape index between 0.2 to 0.4, what you actually start to see is that you get this micro sorting. So you see islands of cells that sort out, but not completely. 
but within islands, basically. And interestingly, this cell shape difference was exactly the same cell shape difference that we had between e here and knockouts and control keratinocytes. So then we asked, can we actually mimic this difference, uh, this micro sorting also really in an, in an, in an experiment? And we mixed control and e here and knockouts. And again, we saw this dim mixing that is exactly at the same level as what we see in, in, in silico, basically. Suggesting that really changes in cell shape can drive local microsorting, and this may then position cells that are actually uh, going to delaminate. Now, when I realize, let me just make sure because there's something missing. Ah, there we have it. Sorry, I had the wrong slide there. So what we then asked is then, so we can see this in 2D. So if you look at just the monolayer, we get this micro sorting upon loss of e here and when we mix this with control cells. So then we asked if we now do long-term 3D sorting where we ask which cell then becomes the one that actually becomes the suprabasal cell. And we mixed e here and, and control cells again, but now let them go for 48 hours when they start to make a multi-layered epidermis and then ask where do these cells end up? And to our somewhat surprise, we found that there was no change in positioning. So loss of e here and does not seem to affect the 3D, the 2D does not seem to affect the 3D positioning, but only the 2D positioning. And then we actually used an organotypic culture to say, okay, so. 3D positioning is not changed, but is then the coupling between cell fate and positioning perhaps changed? And so now we used a similar model, but now used really an organotypic culture where you have really sort of a dermal-like equivalent so that you can really make much better stratification. And we mixed again e here and knock controls with e here and in this case, knockdown cells. And then we asked, where are, what, where are those cells ending up? And, and are they actually, what if we now stain for a basal marker, K14, or a suprabasal marker, which is transglutaminase one in this case, where are these? And I hope you can appreciate it upon loss of e adherin, those are labeled in green. You actually see basal cells that now express a suprabasal marker, but you also see suprabasal cells that express a basal marker, for example, over here. And again, what you can see is that it's not so much that you change the positioning of the knockout cell, Cells, but that now you have uncoupled the positioning from fate regulation, basically. And this is seen over here. So we basically see undifferentiated suprabasal cells, and especially we see uh, differentiated uh, basal cells, basically. So we've uncoupled fate and positioning. And what we're now trying to do, but we have some technical difference, difficulties here, because this is a long-term experiment that hasn't worked very well yet. Uh, for technical reasons, but we're actually trying to now inactivate individual cells in the epidermis and then ask, A, where do they end up? And we would predict that they actually end up normally, but that they have uncoupled their position now from their fate regulation, basically. So um, what we then show is basically that compression induces actomyosin dynamics and junctional dynamics, and this is somehow coupled to differentiation. We still don't know if these two things are really uncoupled and they are coinciding, and if that is regulated. But what it allows is that this, this compression also induces differentiation. And this allows you really to combine to basically coordinate your cell fate changes with your shape changes and positioning. And this is, at least in the developing epidermis, this seems to be one mechanism, how you can actually position and overcome these fate compartments to move into a different fate compartment. Now, so then we said, okay, what then does determine suprabasal positioning if it's not e adherent per se? And here we actually turn to atypical PKC, which is a polarity protein. And we had a long time ago shown that APKC, when you inactivate this in the epidermis, this results in stem cell loss. We actually get a premature aging syndrome. And we actually see cell fate uh, regulation, at least in the hair follicle stem cells, that normally when you inactivate APKC only in the hair follicles, it normally only contributes to the, the lower layers. But on loss of APKC, we now see that these hair follicle stem cells actually end up in, in wrong compartments. And we also know that there's a disturbed tight junctional barrier, but the positioning of the tight junctional barrier is actually still intact. So we did the same thing as I showed you before. We again used just this, this, this what I call cell culture uh, stratification assay, where we mixed APKC knockout cells with controls and then asked which of those cells actually end up. And to our surprise, what we found in this case, we see that APKC knockouts, and this is lambda or the APKC lambda zeta double knockouts, basically do not move up when you mix them with, with control cells. So you get exclusively basal cells whereas the suprabasal cells are basically um, um, all control cells, basically. 
And so we then actually did a big phosphoproteomic proteomic screen, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but what we identified is that APKC not only regulates adherence junctions and tight junctions, which I think is very well established in the literature, but it also regulates desmosomes as well as hemodesmosomes and focal adhesions, both by phosphorylation of certain targets as well as interacting with several of these proteins, basically. And the interactors are basically labeled by the, 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 the brackets, basically. And so what, we, what, what I'm not showing you is but that we know that in part, APKC regulates this suprabasal positioning through desmoglein 3 phosphorylation, as well as probably through beta-4 phosphorylation and, and, and really coordinating cell matrix and cell-cell junctions. And this is just to show that basically the cell matrix junctions are indirect and they're phosphoproteome. So there's more phosphorylation upon loss of APKC, whereas there's less phosphorylation on the intercellular junctions. And the same is true for the proteome. And indeed, when we then look and ask, what, what about force distributions here? And so we stain basically for focal contacts as well as for cell-cell junctions, and then ask, what is the ratio of cell-cell junctions versus uh, cell matrix junctions? We see that there is an increase of cell matrix uh, compared to cell-cell junctions, and that this balance is shifted in, in loss. And this is actually associated with an inability to reorganize the F-actin cytoskeleton, which normally goes initially from stress fibers to a cortical organization, as you can see here in the control. But this remains very much stress fiber-like, and you get this elongated cell-cell junctions uh, in, this, uh, in this system, basically. So you have an impaired switch from cell matrix to cell-cell junctions. And to, to, so basically what we actually, and, and what I haven't shown, but we also know that APKC actually regulates spindle orientation and therefore probably also directly positioning through division uh, in the cell. So we think that APKC really coordinates different parts of this process, not only division orientation and suprabasal positioning, but also the local coordination and adhe of adhesion and forces that allow a cell that, for example, is compressed to coordinate the, the decreased cell-cell junctions and then loss of cell matrix junctions to allow the cell to basically cross the boundary and go into a new fate compartment. Now, one of the things that we also, since we saw this very strong signature of desmosomes, we actually asked those APKC, and we know that desmosomes are even higher upregulated in suprabasal layers. And this is sort of an unfinished story where we're still struggling with uh, the physiological relevance, but I thought maybe I can get some input from you. So basically, we then asked, does APKC also regulate suprabasal junctional and cytoskeletal mechanics? And what we did here is we actually, together with Julich, developed an essay where we can actually stretch keratinocyte multilayer sheets and then have a sensor that measures the force of these, that these forces, uh, that, that these sheets exert on, on um, are exerted by these sheets. And we do this until the sheet breaks, basically. So this is what we call the sheet rupture test. And to our surprise, what we actually found is that APKC results in increased resilience of this sheet and that there is increased force that is actually exerted by the sheet before they break. And, and that there's also an increased maximal force, basically. And when we then try to confirm this in a very different assay, which are these sear stress fragmentation assays, where you basically take the sheets and then you actually see what does it take in terms of force. So we initially do head over, uh, head overs, uh, end over end rotation, and then the sheets are actually not breaking, but if you then do sonication, they are breaking. And what we found is that actually, again, we see that these sheets have much more resilience and in line with what we found with the seed rupture test. And this is actually dependent on desmosomes because if we now knock down DSG3, we can actually rescue this phenotype. So desmosomes are absolutely essential to keep sheet coherence. But then when we looked, if we could see any change in desmosome structure, hyperadhesion or anything, desmosomes are not seem to be not affected. I'm saying this carefully because we still may have missed something here. But what was really different in these sheets, uh, I'm sorry, what was really different is the keratin organization. So this is again a multi-layer sheet. This is a suprabasal cell. And I hope you can appreciate really again this very dramatic change in keratin organization. And if you then look with electron microscopy and we go through the layers, you can actually see that here there's very nice insertion, but that you have these huge bundles that underlie the desmosomes that are basically almost like a cortical bundle, basically. And we see the same in vivo. So this is again the basal layer, suprabasal. And again, 
if I hope you can appreciate in the suprabasal layers, we see these longer, thicker keratin filaments as well in vivo upon loss of APKC. And this was actually accompanied, as I already showed you initially, in the basal cells, this enormous stress fibers. And we can also see this F-actin stress fiber suprabasally. So we, they really never reorganized them into this cortical organization and this, this uh, sort of uh, suspension bridge-like organization that you see in suprabasal cells, but they keep having these very um, strong F-actin stress fibers that again can also be observed in vivo in the suprabasal layers. And there were a couple of papers that actually suggested that actin can organize the keratin network organization. And what we also found that there was increased contractility in these sheets upon loss of APKC. So we then, and we initially thought that it was F-actin organization, but when we did some inhibitor studies, it seemed to be that F-actin organization per se may not be the culprit of this phenotype. So we then asked, is actually this increased contractility important to change this keratin network and increase resilience, basically? And so we used very low levels of blabistatin to A, ask, can we now see a change in keratin network organization? And yes, we can in part reverse this. And this is also here quantified over here. But more importantly, inhibiting with blabistatin, with low levels of blabistatin, we can now see increased fragmentation upon loss of APKC, suggesting that really the increased contractility is important for keratin network organization and epithelial epidermal sheet resistance, basically. And then we ask, is it sufficient? So if we now use control cells and we now induce contractility, can we actually also see this? And yes, that's what we see. So now we use CNO3 to activate ROM. And again, I hope you can see that we can get this nice sort of keratin bundling-like phenotype. It's not as dramatic as the, uh, as the one of the loss of APKC, but there is an increase of a number of cells. And again, we now see, start to see reduced fragmentation. So really showing that the state of actomyosin is important for the keratin state and that that determines uh, keratin resilience. Now, now, what we're really struggling with is why is this? What is the physiological relevance for this? So we thought that if we if you have external stress, then this would actually allow the sheets to be more resilient and not break. And that's why, but that seems to be not the case. So we are having done many essays that we tried, but we haven't had an answer that. So if anybody has a good suggestion there, but what we hypothesize is that APKC actually is sort of a rheostat that when there is stress, that it actually coordinates keratin network organization with the ectomycin contractility state. And upon loss of APKC, we seem to have more pre-stress in the tissue. And the, and, and the idea is that basically keratin senses this and actually then increases and alters its conformation to basically counteract this increased pre-stress. And of course, we think that this probably needs to couple because we need to have the dynamics through actomyosin contractility, but we need the resilience to keep barrier function. So we're really trying to sort of say, is this now important for movement through the different layers? And is this important to keep barrier function? Now we know that APKC loss also has a barrier defect. So we, we still don't really understand how these different uh, functions are actually coupled. But what I think it really clearly shows is that there is a strong crosstalk between these two networks and that we hypothesize that that is important to enable upward movement and intercellular rearrangements while we are also maintaining this barrier function basically. And I don't know if I still have like 10 minutes to go, but I want to move a little bit to the last part with the, the tumor part, basically. So the last question we then asked is, so if you now have these changes in mechanics in cell division, are we, how, what role does that play in, in, in tumor formation, basically? So if we disturb these, these, because we know we have altered junction formation, we have altered mechanics. So can we, what role does that play in skin carcinogenesis? And of course, APKC has been highly implicated in both proliferation in cell polarity and cell shape changes, as well as an EMT to regulate migration and invasion. So, and what we had shown previously that if we take a DMBA TPA, which actually causes RAS mutations, and that causes in the skin, you actually get skin papilloma formation, that upon loss of APKC lambda, but also its binding partner bar, bar three, we actually get reduced tumor formation, okay? We get increased invasion. So we see increased invasion, but in those few tumors that we see, but the initial tumor induction uh, phenotype is much, much less. And this, especially Sandra Eden had shown that this is through junction dependent sustained growth and inflammation. And so we were actually looking then at a huge panel of human squamous cell carcinomas of the skin. 
And then we quantified basically intermediate levels that look like controlled epidermis, high levels and low levels. And the majority of those have indeed overexpression of APKC. But there was also a significant number of tumors that had very, very low levels of APKC. And when we then looked at those patients and asked who are the patients that have metastasis-free survival, then both high levels, but especially low levels, was very predictive of having a, a decreased metastasis-free survival, basically, really suggesting that these low levels of APKC were significant. So then we said, we maybe have to think about a different model. And if you really think about skin cancer and non-melanoma skin cancer, one of the exceptional things is that the skin can actually carry mutations in, for example, P53, but also notch that we know are in principle tumorigenic, but they will not result in clear tissue architecture changes, basically. So in chronic UV radiated, we already have P53 mutations. And then we go to what we call carcinoma in situ or field cancerization, where you see pre-malignant cells, but the tissue architecture is still somewhat preserved. And then 10% of those will really go to squamous cell carcinoma, basically. So that raises the questions, if these P53 mutations are already in very early stages, what are the barriers for these mutations to not really develop into uh, skin tumors, basically? What are barriers to progression? And so, and the skin cancer model is basically that we know that there's epithelial alterations and that they cross talk a lot with stromal alterations and that you get these precancerous cells that are basically UV induced already. And then through secondary insults, now these precancerous cells also through stromal co uh, communication can actually really develop into malignant cells. So we thought that since we know that P53 mutations in humans are there, we'd use loss of P53 and combine that with APKC. And what we actually get is the exact opposite from when we induce Rust mutations. So now we get this huge skin cancerous model. We see much, much, and this is really, I think, I was really amazed when I saw these mice, really dramatic increase, um, uh, yeah, early onset of tumor formation in these mice. And you're not only getting individual tumors, but the whole skin basically become precancerogenous. And then you see that you get local really malignant cells where they invade, they break down the basement membrane and these cells really invade basically. So this is really a dramatic, so loss of APKC really releases a boundary towards tumor formation. And what we found when we then looked is that already early on, and we're now looking at a very early time point. So this is 21 days after birth, where we already know that there is a slight change in the barrier, and we see some changes in these junctions, basically. So we have some cell shape changes are there. And then we see that there is actually the stromal compartment, that there's a strong increase in macrophages, for example. And when we took this early time point and then looked with RNA sequencing, I'm not going to go through all of the RNA sequencing, but we found that monocyte proliferation, cytokine-mediated signaling, and inflammation was strongly, strongly upregulated. So then Oana, the postdoc, said, okay, what about STAT3? Is that actually increased? Because that sort of is a sort of a downstream converger of all of these signals, uh, inflammatory signals in epithelial cells. And we indeed found an increase in phosphostat 3 in the epidermis already very early on in this, um, in this, in these tumors, basically. And so then we asked, okay, if, is STAT3 then really important for these changes that we're seeing? So we made now triple knockouts, basically. And so to, to basically really ask, is this increase in STAT3 early on really important? So we made this triple knockouts, and I hope you can appreciate that upon loss of STAT3, which in and of itself has a slight phenotype, so one always has to think about that, but we now really reverse the, the, the cytal architectural changes in the epidermis, we see a reduction in epidermal proliferation and a reduction in, in macrophages, basically. And what I'm not going to show you, but this also depends on HIF and hypoxia signaling in the epidermis. And what was very interesting, if we now looked at this high and low APKC again in this human uh, tissue cohort that we have, is that we knew that in both tumor from models where APKC is basically inhibiting tumor, uh, promotes tumor formation, whereas in the P53 model, it inhibits carcinogenesis. But in both cases, we know that inflammation and the microenvironment plays a role. And that's exactly what you see when you use a, a general macrophage marker. But if you now look at phosphostat 3 or HIV-1 alpha signaling, which really in our tumor models was only seen in the P53 model, we now see an increase of phosphostat 3 that is associated with the low APKC, but not with the high APKC model. And the same is true with HIV-1-alpha. So we can actually differentiate those different tumors uh, 
based on APKC status as well as inflammatory status. And so to, to come to my final slides, basically, so we think that that, that basically the, 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 the cell architecture and the cell mechanics, although that is still an hypothesis, and I'll come back to that, is actually really important to actually have a boundary for, for basically um, field cancerization. And that upon loss of P53, if your cyto architecture is still normal, you can actually prevent this, this priming of the microenvironment. But then upon loss of APKC, we now see that we get inflammatory signals in the epidermis that then recruits macrophages, but also T cells. And this really then allows these cells to escape now the, the, the confines of the normal tissue architecture, result in a carcinoma in situ, in our case also in squamous cell carcinomas. So what we're now really trying to ask is that you basically there is a, a tumor suppressive versus tumor promotive context for APKC and probably its role in, in regulating mechanics and, and cell and tissue architecture. Um, that where in certain contexts it's actually a, a tumor suppressive, um, a, a tumor suppressor, whereas in other contexts we know it can also function as a tumor promoter. And so then the question is what is then the role of really regulation of tissue architecture by APKC? in either having a tumor promoter or tumor suppressor context. So is it the barrier that is important? Is the cell and tissue mechanics per se already early on in the cell shape changes? Is it, is it the cell phase changes? And honestly, we see evidence for all three in our microarray. So it will be hard to, we, we now wanna really dissect that question and ask uh, what is the role of those. And so I hope today, I hope that I, that you understand a little bit my fascination with this tissue that we actually believe and that we have some evidence that you really can use mechanics to set up fate compartments within the skin and functional compartments. And one example was the tijunctional barrier function with the SG2, that we also can use local mechanics that have to be integrated with global mechanics where cells then are can allow to actually move up and, 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 and cross fate compartments to come into a new fate compartment. And that this is basically local symmetry breaking uh, that is there important. And with that, I'd like to really thank my lab and a lot of collaborators, because I think some of this you we weren't able to do all by ourselves, but especially Matthias Rupsam, who did all of the EGF receptor stuff and the APKC suprabasal keratin. Um, basically, Frederick Telkamp, who did a lot of the proteomics, phosphoproteomics, and the analysis of some of the phosphocytes there that I haven't talked about so much and Skylar and um, 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 Jabis, who basically, I, I haven't talked about it, do, do, do all of the cell division work on APKC. And, and I think here, especially the, 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 the collaboration with Lisa Manning, with uh, Aaron Mertz, as well as um, Robin Poulin and Rudolf Merkel and Jülich and, uh, and Sarah Wikström were really important. Um, so thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to some questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. That was uh, a lot, a lot of, of really fascinating data. Um, as always, if folks want to use the raise hand function or type question in the chat, um, they can. we can call on you. And also, if you leave questions, we'll, we'll ask on your behalf. Um, one question for me is I was wondering, since there is this stiffness gradient that you, you know, you illustrated towards the beginning of your talk, um, I'm wondering if you are all thinking about durotaxis as a mechanism of promoting migration from the subbasal um, outward up yes. the stiffness gradient. Yes, so this is exactly what I'm more and more thinking about. So I have to, because um, initially we really thought it was intercellular rearrangements that are basically e adherent driven. And what, what my hypothesis now is that e adherent is actually important to position those cells that go up and, and, and so have the initial rearrangements necessary, but that there might actually be active migration towards the stiffness gradient that is important. It's of course not so easy to test, but um, uh, that's exactly where, so the question is how much is delamination coupled to active migration versus cell rearrangements basically. And, uh, I think we cannot exclude that. And that's also why we now, maybe it's not sorting, but it's really positioning and it's active positioning. So it's an active process instead of a push out process, because that could be the other way, right? That you just simply have compression. So you have cell division and then that cell is basically pushed out, but instead of, you know, sim similar like, uh, like uh, extrusion, but now you make a second layer. And 
that that is a big question. I cannot give you any answers, but I think the fact that E could hear in knockout sort in 2D, but not in 3D suggests that there might be another mechanism in play, but it's of course very weak evidence, I have to say at this point. <laughs> As a follow-up, can I ask, so do you see directed like things like protrusions, like pedipodia in the upward direction versus downwards? Um, so yes, in vitro, but I think in vitro, our model is, is a proxy, but is perhaps not exactly how it works in vivo. So one other reason to look in vivo now really carefully at single cells labeling and then even imaging those, which is again, not completely trivial, but we, so, uh, so we, you can do either ex vivo explants, but we feel that some of the mechanics are actually changing when you take them out of the, the context. So we can image embryos. Um, and so we're looking exactly at that, Adam, because I think that this is a really important. So do we actually see protrusions? Are those protrusions directed? What is the role of those protrusions? Are they used for communication or not? I cannot tell, I, it's too early, but uh, we hope that we can soon have more info on that. But in vitro, we do see, so what you're seeing is these cells in a, in a confluent layer where we're again labeling individual, and then you see they crawl on top of each other. So it seems to be in that sense, an active migration. But I'm also not always clear how good that model is in vivo, I, I have to say. I'm, I'm, I think it, it, it's, it's a good proxy and we can use it for certain things, but I think it's not completely mimicking the in vivo system. Fantastic, thank you. Um, a question from um, Hani Suleiman um, saying, great talk. And this is towards the beginning of your, your talk that he posted this question, um, asking if there are any changes in transcription factors related to the compression, for example, differences in YAPTAS. Um, I need to look. Well, we, we looked at Japtas and we didn't see it, but of course there's beautiful work from, um, 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 I think it's Blampin, and he basically, the Blampin lab, and what they did is they put actually a, a ball underneath this, so they have the first in vivo model where they put basically stretch on the skin, and this has been used in surgery to expand the skin. And there he clearly sees that if you have, you know, initial stretch on the skin, yaptas will change, okay? So in our model where we looked at compression, we, we, we did not see obvious changes in yaptas, but I think it, I'm pretty sure it will be involved in some way, somehow, as some of the other um, SRF signaling, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm sure of that. And in vivo, that clearly is the case when you do stretching on skin. So stretching on the skin will activate yaptas. And that actually then results initially in an expansion of basal cells that then differentiate. So you couple that to really make more functional skin, basically. Thanks. Uh, Anna is asking, um, saying that uh, PARM and APKC influence uh, myosin and its contractility. Um, so she's asking if, did you look at PAR6 and myosin in your APKC knockouts? Um, did we look at PAR6? So unfortunately, the antibodies that we have to PAR6 are bad. So I, I cannot, you, you, you mean PAR6, right? The binding partner of APKC, right? Okay. Yeah, PAR6. So what we have generated um, is actually, so there's three PAR6 in, in mice, and uh, that has been uh, complicating issues always a little bit. So we've now, using CRISPR-Cas, generated flux mice for two. And for one of those uh, that is probably the most uh, dominant one in, 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 in the epidermis, we can actually phenocopy this sorting phenotype. We haven't done too much yet, so I, I want to be careful because these mice are early stage. But when we isolate those carotinocytes, they behave exactly the same as APKC in terms of 3D positioning. We haven't looked at myosin yet. Of course, we are looking at myosin, but Again, what we so if we look at cortical stiffness, what we're seeing is not so. If you look for statistically significant difference and you collapse all the data, there is no statistical dif difference. But if we, um, but what but what you see is that there seems to be more spread. So if you look at this individual cells, you see that some cells are very much like controls. But now you have many more cells that are um, that have higher cortical tension. Um, and then we also looked at, for example, when we do this space treatment, these sheets roll, roll up and you see much more increased roll up suggesting much more actomyosin tension. So 
all the evidence points out that there really is an increased actomyosin tension, and especially since the inhibitors and activators had those effects on keratins, especially in the sheets, that seems to be an important point. But um, we had a hard time looking with just phosphomyosin to really show there's more, but that may be us. Great, great. Um, a question from um, C. Chang uh, asking, do you know what mediates the actin keratin crosstalk in your system? Hmm. I wish we knew. So we've tested several proteins. We actually also looked at some of the linkers. Um, one candidate that we're looking at is plectin because it's both an actin binding protein as well as a keratin binding protein. Uh, and we have some phosphocytes that are in there. The initial phosphocytes we looked at were not, oh, no, no, we haven't done. That's another protein. Sorry, I'm mixing up the, we tried different things that weren't it. So, um, so I'd know. So the short answer is no, we don't know. But we, one candidate that we're mo at the moment looking at is plectin also because we know it actually affects, there's a beautiful JCB paper that, 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 that uh, was basically published not so long ago. And that really showed that plectin regulates mechanical uh, properties of, of epithelial sheets, basically. But um, the other question is, is it simply a reaction to it? And again, then the question is what communicates that? Is it sim simply a signaling reaction? But that's um, that I cannot answer. I wish I knew. We're a bit stuck in that pro project in that sense. Um, well, hopefully that'll mean good things will be coming, right? Being stuck sometimes <laughs> uh, can help move us forward. Um, I wanted to say, so my my mom comes on some of these calls and during the cancer part of your talk, she sent me a message saying that it was a good reminder to see a d dermatologist every year. So um, <laughs> a reminder from, uh, from the moms of the world. Um, so I was really fascinated about your phenotype where you saw those, um, those stress fibers coming out in your um, APK APKC knockdowns, we see stress fibers in my system after we compress epithelial cells. And those are the cells that are becoming migratory as the ones with these basal wow. stress fibers. And I was just, I was wondering if you're seeing more migration in those, you know, those cells that are having these stress fibers that shouldn't be there. Yes. So yes. So one of the things, so what we see, if, but this is now in the hair follicle compartment. So we did a, a really a long time ago, we were um, um, collaborating with Valentina Grego, and then they did some imaging on our APKC knockout mice. And although I cannot say that they're more migratory, it seemed that there was more loose cells. It was easier for these cells to rearrange, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, we could never make it hard with those images. And now seeing that keratin act in crosstalk again and seeing also the suprabasal, we're actually wondering if these cells are unable to go from sort of this stress fiber actin that is necessary to move up, but then they need to change it to sort of more cortical actin type of system. So one of the things that we actually want to do is, is look, is transition time different? Can you follow the transition time? And is that different between those two? And again, can you label, these are, it sounds easy, but it's actually these, these multi-layered experiments are not so easy uh, to really look then, are they more migratory if you now image those? What is of course weird again, if you now mix them with controls, the control cells are better able to do that. And they can also reorganize their F-actin system, which the APKC cells cannot. So is APKC necessary for this reorganization that allows efficient uh, suprabasal layering? I have to say, if you just have control, if, if you just have all APKC, so again, I think the local change in mechanics or the local difference in mechanics is essential. Because if you just have APKC complete knockout cells, they are able to make a suprabasal layer. Now we haven't looked completely at the timing, but if we look at different time points, we haven't found a difference. So maybe this is something that we also have to look at, is it slowed down? But if you give given enough time, they can do it. Or is it, um, is it really when you induce local and then mechanical difference? And it's the same for e-cadherin. If you have total e-cadherin knockouts, they can make a subprovisal layer. There's no change, also not in cell fate regulation. Okay, fascinating. And just, um, and I'll call on you one, one second, um, just as a quick clarification. So um, you only see migration sort of between layers. You, do, you never see it like laterally within a layer. Is that correct? No, I wouldn't say that. So we know, for example, that, that stem cells can actually also migrate laterally. And we know that because you can actually see that clones become larger 
or that, for example, that if you have a skin blistering disease where you have a non-competent stem cell, then this will be taken over by another stem cell domain. So within limits, the question is, are the limits? I think we don't understand that, but the data indirectly really suggests that there's also basal um, rearrangement. And here, it can okay. be actually be very important, local regulation. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, Anna, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, great, great talk. I have two questions before. Uh, besides the localization of par six, is just if you look at the myosin heavy chain phosphorylation that we know can be phosphorylated by PKC and induce disassembly of uh, bipolar filaments, and in that will change uh, obviously the contractility and tension in the cell. And my other question is about like in the places where you see these big stress fibers and then a lot of tension, have you looked have you looked at FAC localization and phosphorylation on those sites? Because FAC can signaling uh, towards the division uh, and cell death. So I was just uh, wondering about these two pathways. Yes, I mean, I, I, I take your point. They're very good. So in terms of the heavy chain phosphorylation, I would have to ask Matthias again, but to my knowledge, we didn't see obvious changes. And also in our phosphoproteomics, that was not one of the phosphocytes that seemed to be regulated. Let's put it that way. But that can be a timing issue because we didn't do like 20 time points uh, because we basically took, you know, just one time point and then did a huge screen. Yeah. Um, we have, and I now I need to look again. We haven't looked at FAC. We uh, at the moment really focused. I was, because I think APKC, there's so much known on how it regulates actin coordinated junctions. For me, the fascinating part that I really thought of our phosphoproteomics was this new regulation of both desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. And my old love is hemidesmosomes. So I basically really was fascinated that we had this phospho track and that's what we're looking into right now. And again, so it's clearly important, but it's not a simple on off. So uh, it's probably really the, the dynamics of phosphorylation there that is important, but we have a new phospho stretch that maybe that seems to be important for the dynamics of uh, sorting and delamination basically in 3D. But we haven't looked at FAC. So I, and I, from now out, out of the top of my head, is it regulated upon loss of APKC? I, I would have to check. I just, I, I, I think it might be, but I would have to check my table again. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm blanking on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's because I, it, my question was because if you have phosphorylation in the heavy chain, in the tails, not in the, in the light chain, you may induce defos, uh, disassembly of the filaments. So you will lose contractility. Mm -hmm or you can increase that. Yeah, ah, thank you. Okay. So that's, no, thank you. Well, that's a very nice tip actually. I need to recheck that now again, that we actually check that. Thank you, Anna, that's really helpful. All right, awesome. Um, all right, I think um, that is all the questions that we have for now. So with that, I'm going to um, end our YouTube live stream. So for everyone on there, bye-bye and see you next week. And next week will be our last for spring 2022. We have uh, Manu Prakash from uh, Stanford University 